This is the story of the boy who was born to be king. All right, Zelda. A boy born into extraordinary circumstances, but who craved normality. An idyllic childhood that ended in tragedy. He had to grow up in the spotlight and had duty thrust upon him when he just wanted to be like everyone else. I don't like being treated any different at all, which is why I just think I get along with these guys so well as well. And for any of you people who are in a bit of a mood for love, this song is for you. He would still be there if we'd given him the chance. He just loved it. A regular student. We suddenly got a flood of applications from American women wanting to come and study at St Andrews University. He was just one of the lads. I just want to go in there and get my asparagus or whatever. And I remember William coming back, I think after celebrating the end of his exams and falling into a bush. A loving brother. We're going to be very good in our Santa, very nicely. Yes. <laughs> or or um, ring his mobile. Or ring my mobile. Yeah. No. Shut up. <laughs> uh, the world's most eligible bachelor. He touched me. He's a good looking chap, isn't he? Who found his true love. I took her up somewhere nice in, uh, in Kenya and, uh, and proposed. It's very romantic. There's a true romantic in that. There is. <laughs> that led to the wedding of the century. It was bubbling, crackling with excitement and glee. A loyal serviceman. He works his shifts like any other one of the guys on the base, and he is just one of them. The boy who, at 30, has at last found his place as the man who will one day be our king. I thought William didn't even want to be a member of the royal family. Now I know that he's just perfect for this job. begins in 1982. Britain is taking the pop world by storm. But for many, times are tough, with over three million unemployed. The previous summer, the nation rejoiced at the fairy tale wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. One year on, it seemed the fairy tale was complete as the world waited with bated breath for the birth of their first child. And I should think if she's having all this trouble, it's a boy. It's a boy. The Princess of Wales's first baby, the next in line to the throne after Prince Charles himself, has been born at St Mary's Hospital in London. They the have been singing, uh, well done, Charlie, let's have another one. Uh, really? On the program of events. Bloody yeah. hell, give us a chance. <laughs> the new prince has blue eyes like both his parents, and he cries lustily. There was the fairy tale wedding, and now we've got a future king, you know, ticking all the boxes. The proud and now rested father was the first to arrive this morning. How are you? I'm all right, thank you very much. Weighing in at seven pounds, one and a half ounces, Everyone wanted the first picture of the young prince. If you were there on a certain time, at a certain day, at a certain hour, you would, uh, that Charles and Diana would pose on the steps, um, both of them holding William. Those pictures of uh, Charles and Diana coming down the steps of the Lindo Wing at Paddington Hospital, Diana sort of cradling this, this tiny little bundle. Couldn't see William, of course, because he was wrapped up in a, in a bundle. May we see your son, your Royal Highness? There was some scaffolding to climb as high as he could on this scaffolding to get a picture of the baby's face because you couldn't see. And we did do that, and we had, we had sort of perhaps the only picture the next day of the baby's face. <laughs> it's nice to see members of the royal family just be like everyone else, just so happy taking their baby home. William's first year was spent with his family in Kensington Palace. But for the heir apparent, there could be no escape from the huge public interest. And before his second birthday, duty called as he was paraded in front of the world's media. He was fascinated. He sort of looked around at all these strange people. <laughs> he's touching the cameras and he's doing everything. It was things that you would not have got prior to Diana. 
the electronic news gathering techniques. <laughs> like all little boys, William was fascinated by what was going on. He was only a tiny toddler, but he went up to the cameraman, and I always remember the cameraman took the camera and swung it round so that William could actually look through the eyepiece. So Charles bends down with him and shows him the camera, and he's looking at us through the viewfinder. Oh, see the faces? There are people in there. It's called a microphone. I can imagine microphone. Charles sort of saying, well, what's going on here? Well, I remember Diana saying he doesn't know how much of that he's going to see in the future. It was the beginning of an uneasy relationship between press and Prince. On September 15th of the same year, with William now two, a little brother, Harry, was born, completing the royal family unit. A year later, he made royal history as the first heir to the throne to attend a public nursery. And with press interest in the royals at an all-time high, William had to face the paparazzi who were out in full force as he arrived for his first day at Mrs. Minor's. You know, he was clinging to his mother. He, you, you could see that he was, as any boy would be about their first day at school, nervous. And off he went, um, just glancing very briefly for the photographers to get a picture. One of the nicknames for him when he was little was Basher Wills because he wasn't afraid to get into a few scraps. He was a little bit of a daredevil. Um, he liked getting up to all sorts of mischief. In 1986, aged four, he graduated from kindergarten to Weatherby School. And once again, it was front page news. So we arrived at the school, and there was literally probably 80 to 100, whatever, I can't remember, but there was a huge bank of photographers. I remember Diana saying, now, William, you've got to be careful now, because, you know, when you go to the school, there'll be lots of um, photographers and press. And he sort of turned around just underneath the peak of his hat, and he said, I don't like photographers. William's early school life was as normal as it could be, but he was still being groomed for a life of duty, and the young prince was finding it hard. Diana told me that uh, from a young age, he felt the burden of kingship on his shoulders, and he found that a very heavy burden to bear. But she thought he had the makings of a great king, and she said, um, the country's really lucky to have William, you know. William is all right. Despite the obligations of office, his mother insisted that her boys would have as normal an upbringing as possible. William's life from the moment that he was born was extraordinary. And the eye has always been that Diana wanted to raise him as ordinary and normal, but it was the one thing that he could never be. And it was important that William and Harry understood that while they were privileged, there were people who weren't so privileged. All right, Father. Very consciously, she said, there will be work days and there will be play days. On on work days, you have to dress up like young princes and you have to behave that way. But on your play days, yep, you can wear your jeans, you can have baseball caps, you can eat a burger. I have to say that the, 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 the prince would, would have probably had a fit to think that his son was eating McDonald's. And just like every other child in the land, William and Harry love nothing more than a day out with Mum at a theme park. There was no queue jumping and using their VIP status, they queued just like everyone else. The more thrilling the ride, the more times they wanted to go on it. <laughs> Is there any chance of any one of us getting drenched or falling in somewhere, well, then that was even an added piece of fun for them. There is a photograph which shows myself and the princess and the two boys roaring with laughter. And the reason that we're laughing is that this was at the end of the ride, and behind us were the security detail, five fairly large individuals. So whilst we'd had a relatively modest splash, they'd had a huge splash, which had soaked a lot of them. I remember coming back to Kensington Palace, I mean, seriously drenched thanks to um, William and Harry. By 1992, William, now 10, was a boarder at Luggrove Prep School in Berkshire. To the outside world, it looked like an idyllic childhood, but the year brought turmoil to the House of Windsor. 
the fire at Windsor Castle, the breakup of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, and worst of all for William, his mother and father's marriage in crisis, leading the Queen to publicly describe it as a terrible year. The body language between Charles and Diana was non-existent. It was so frosty that you could have driven an icebreaker between the two of them and not cracked the ice. It was all beginning to take its toll on the young William, who had to shoulder the burden of his parents' breakup. William was just about to enter those very um, difficult teenage years and had to do so with the backdrop of his parents' marriage disintegrating in the most publicly awful way. Diana did put tremendous responsibility on William's shoulders as someone to comfort and to talk to and to be with. And there's one really moving story when Diana was in tears in, in her bathroom and William was pushing tissues under the door because he could hear her crying. Be all right, Mum, it'll be all right, I'll look after you. I mean, that's, it's, it was all the wrong way round for William. He was having to comfort his mother when she should have been looking after him. He was just a little boy. Despite the turmoil in his home life, William passed the Eton entrance exam and took up a place at the elite boarding school. On his first day, both his parents were by his side. Sadly, this display of solidarity was just for the cameras. He had his own life there and his own set of friends, and I think he blossomed, actually, at, at Eton. But William's world was about to be rocked as Diana went global on the state of her marriage on national television. It was gobsmacking to hear the sort of thing she came out with, three of us in this marriage and all the other things. I remember watching it and calling Diana afterwards. She wouldn't take my call initially, but I eventually got through to her, saying that it was the stupidest thing that she had ever done. And for William, who had always supported his mother, this time, she had gone too far. For him, the idea of, of playing out one's troubles and wearing one's heart on one's sleeve so publicly and bringing humiliation onto the royal family, um, well, that was a big no-no. He was desperately upset. Couldn't believe that she'd uh, laid her soul so bare. He refused to speak to his mother for some days after that, and bear in mind how close they were. This was absolutely devastating for Diana. Coming up, tragedy strikes. William's first concern was how they would break the news to Harry because it was going to destroy his youngest brother. Lots of people's mummies have died, but not many people's mummies have died so publicly. And William pursues his dream of normality. I don't like being treated any different at all. I don't like special treatment at all, which is why I just, I, I think I get along with these guys so well. By 1997, 15-year-old William was flourishing both academically and on the playing fields of Eton. He was also having to come to terms with splitting his time between his divorced parents, but showed an early maturity, flitting comfortably between two very different worlds. The summer was spent holidaying on a luxury yacht in Saint-Tropez with Diana and Dodie Fayette. But as the boys returned to Balmoral to see their father, Everything was about to change. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. The crash happened at about uh, uh, half past 11 UK time. I was asleep in bed and the phone rang. I think the time was oh, something like one in the morning and he said, there's been this crash in Paris, Dodie is dead and we think the princess is dead too. And we didn't know until UK time, around about quarter past three, that she had actually died. And I, within half an hour, was in the palace. Diana, Princess of Wales, who died four o'clock this morning in Paris. Everybody who saw that unfold on the television that morning thought, oh, my God, those poor boys. Charles decided that there was no point in waking up the boys at that point. And uh, Charles went walking on the moors, um, across the Scottish moors, to try and clear his head and brace himself for what must surely have been the hardest thing as a father he has ever had to do. He would wait until, I think, probably about 7 a.m. And he took it upon himself to uh, go and tell William and Harry the awful news about their mother, which is uh, pretty 
tough call for anyone. The first son, he told, was William. He went into his room um, shortly after 7.30 and told him that his mother had been killed. There is an account that is that William's first concern was how they would break the news to Harry because it was going to destroy his youngest brother. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how royal you are, it doesn't matter which castle you're in or where you're sleeping, if you've lost your mum or you've lost your dad, then, you know, then it's catastrophic. But their personal heartbreak became a national tragedy. The royal family closed the doors of Balmoral and rallied around the boys. As the days passed, public pressure mounted on the Queen to return to London and address the nation. What the Queen did for the first time in her life, she put the family before duty. The Queen had um, pulled the shutters down. That's it. You know, now we're a family. Forget everything else. And was hugely criticised for it at the time. After six days, the Queen relented and with her family returned to Buckingham Palace. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion to her two boys. Private grieving had to be put to one side, and as always, duty called. Charles took William and Harry to view the flowers and meet the mourners outside Kensington Palace. There's an old saying in, in royal circles, you do not wear private grief on a public sleeve. It, it's sort of very much a credit to their, both their parents that they were able to cope in public under such sort of desperate grief. William, William. Thank you so much. That's above and beyond, you know, going out and looking at those flowers which were, were, were for, for, for your mum. I can't, can't imagine what sort of fortitude that took to, to walk out of the, the gates that day and hold it together. Then, on Saturday, the 6th of September, the world, Britain, and most importantly, her boys, bid their final farewell to Diana. And the atmosphere in London, the huge crowds, but how quiet those crowds were. It was the most unique atmosphere I've ever felt on a London street. You could sort of cut the air. When the day of the funeral came, William, I think, was still uncertain as to whether he would agree to walk behind uh, his mother's coffin. Grandfather Prince Philip said, if I walk, will you? And I think Prince William thought it was such a wonderful thing of his grandfather. And I think it's a decision he'll never, ever regret. And then the coffin comes along, and there's the boys walking along behind them with the Duke of Edinburgh and Prince Charles. No one expected that. And the sadness and remorse in Charles's face as he's standing by the hearse looking down at William. The picture tells a thousand words, that one does. The other most poignant moment that day, I think, was when suddenly we saw a card on, on the hearse with the flowers on the coffin, and it just said the simple word, mummy. And I don't think there is a mother in the nation who didn't have a big lump in her throat and a tear in her eye when she saw that. That's what you'd write. That's the card you'd put on the top of the coffin. That's what it was, you know, that was a card to their mum. Lots of people's mummies have died, but not many people's mummies have died so publicly. Although William had to grow up quickly after his mother's death, it brought him and brother Harry closer to their father. Early the next year, they went on a state visit to Canada where 15-year-old William had to fulfil yet another role, that of a royal pin-up. A tall 15-year-old with a demure smile and his mother's looks is the very latest teenage heartthrob. Welcome to Will Mania. My goodness me, William turned out to be very handsome indeed. Tall and handsome, a prince, uh, the most eligible young man around, and the world went mad. 
He said hi and he shook my hand. He touched my he hand. Shook He's a good looking chap, isn't he? The royal family must have been thinking, oh, this is unbelievable. I tried to shake his hand. <laughs> Thousands of screaming young girls hung out with him. He looked very embarrassed and awkward. Harry thought this was even funnier, of course, and uh, whenever they were out of view, he'd nudge William and said, go on, go on, give him another wave. And so, sort of, William would, and those screams all around, it was just crazy. And whenever he's been asked about it since, he, he really seems to sort of laugh off or, or shirk off that image of him as a pinup. It was the new millennium and school was out for the 18-year-old prince. William dreamed of putting his royal obligations aside by taking a gap year playing polo in Argentina. But even now, duty called. His father insisted that any trip his son took must be vocational and have purpose. So William flew 8,000 miles to Chile, where he spent three months with Operation Rally, a voluntary aid mission where he took part in community projects. We worked with him and his team to ensure that, you know, his, his experience was going to be like any other person. To be honest, no one knew there was a Prince of England uh, in, in the midst until he arrived, but word got out very quickly. He couldn't keep that secret for sure. Thank you very, very much. I don't like being treated any different at all. I don't like special treatment at all, which is why I just, I, I think I get along with these guys so well as well. William's like one of the lads, like he gets involved with everyone. Really friendly. He, yeah. He's like a lad, you know what I mean? He just have a laugh with him. And he walks out of this competition, head held low, not very happy. <laughs> he was just like a, a good friend. It was more the older girls, which is quite strange, isn't it? That were like, oh my God, it's William, but he's not my type anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm Will. Hola, me, uh, me amo Guillermo. And he also spent time working with the local school, teaching English. When you catch the ball, you say, my name is, my name is Will. I am a wombat. He was absolutely fantastic with kids and the young people, singing songs, teaching them basic English. <laughs> and also getting on the local radio station. And for any of you people who are in a bit of a, a, bit of a mood for love, this song is for you. I offered to cut his hair for him, but I offered to try and shave it off for him so he wouldn't let me cut it anymore because I told him he wanted his skin out. I would have been so proud if I would have been able to say, oh, William's hair, I did it, come to my salon, I'll cut your hair. The living conditions that they uh, find themselves in were certainly basic, to say the least. The whole project group lived in one room, sleeping on mats with one toilet between them all. Ah. Oh, dear. He knew when his, his day would come to clean that toilet. It wasn't every day, you know, we took it in turns. But he always looked forward to it, for sure. <laughs> now, there can't be many members of the royal family who clean loos, actually. Uh, but, but William's got an early start on that. He's, on tomorrow. He's got to know what makes us tick. He's going to be king one day. This is, like, the last time we ever saw William. And when it was coming to the crunch, like, he was leaving. Um, he had to go dash off early. I was made up to meet him and have the opportunity to be friends with him. But he, he thanked me and like shook hands and that was it. He's gone. He would still be there if we'd given him the chance. He just loved it. Coming up, William meets a special someone at university. And I remember seeing the two of them at the bar and him pinching her bottom. And that, that was the first time I remember thinking, well, they're definitely a couple then. William Wales. And suddenly it brought home to everybody the time of Will being protected in this sort of bubble uh, was over and that all the speculation would probably begin. And the pressure's on for William and Kate. I, at the time, wasn't very happy about it. 